everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot La Mode and today on Hot La Mode we are going to be reviewing all of the Haute Couture shows from the fall 2020 season that you need to know about. Haute Couture is actually doing for the first time in its history a fully digital season. Now for the most part Haute Couture is a craftsmanship of clothing in which everything is pretty much hand done. Whether it's weaving, embroidery, feather work, lace, all of it is done by hand. The other thing about Haute Couture is it's incredibly important that you actually go to places like Paris, which is the home of Haute Couture, and actually do multiple fittings for your clothing because oftentimes many people say getting a piece of Haute Couture is like getting a piece of second skin. It's meant to be fitted specifically to your body. So it's important that you actually go to Paris when you're purchasing it so that it fits properly, because listen, I wouldn't want to pay $100,000 for a dress that fits like shit. So honestly, the whole idea of haute couture is crazy because not a lot of people can even travel to Paris. I mean, the Americans, we're kicked out, we're done. France said, no, which I mean, like I get, we're a hot ass disaster, but it's just crazy to see that this ancient craft, and by ancient, I mean, it's, you know, two or 300 years old, is going through an incredible change in the midst of coronavirus. There is not a sector of the fashion industry that has been untouched by this pandemic. So with that, let's get into some of our haute couture reviews. The first brand we'll be talking about is Scaparelli. Daniel Roseberry is a mixed bag for me. I've seen incredible work and referencing to the house's founder, Elsa. I've also seen some pieces that remind me of what you'd see on a strange acid trip. But this season, we won't actually be seeing any clothing at all from Daniel and Scaparelli. Unfortunately, Daniel never got the chance to get back to the atelier in Paris, which means no haute couture. Instead, the brand debuted sketches, and honestly, I really loved some of them. Fashion designers often make beautiful clothing, but something I really love is their sketches. There is no limitations on the model's body, the fabrics, the textures, the colors, or cuts, and well, it makes for a fantastical group of clothes that don't actually exist. The sketch styles are varied, but starts with a reference to Look 2 from the Fall 2019 Haute Couture collection, with one shoulder draped in a fluffy white fabric. Then came a gathered beige set. The top was cropped with large sleeves and a turtleneck, while the skirt was knee length and slit partially up the back. A tape measure leash showcased a Sharpe dog, which is known for its wrinkles and extra skin. In a way, the dog and model mirror each other in what is often called biomimicry. Biomimicry is defined as the design and production of materials, structures, and systems that are modeled on biological entities and processes. Meaning, the excess skin of the Sharpe dog was the model for the gathering of the fabric and its color. In reality, biomimicry is the way of fashion's future, and Roseberry, as well as Iris Van Herpen, another couturier who we will be discussing, are helping to bring fashion into a somewhat eco-conscious consciousness. The next three looks utilize a tape measure print as piping for suits, shirts, and coats, which is a nod to the brand's Shocking des Scaparelli perfume bottles and shoes that Roseberry showed for spring 2020 haute couture. The first gown we see seems translucent as it exposes the model's nipples and has a high-low skirt that starts at the mid-thigh. It's very reminiscent of dresses we have seen before from Roseberry, namely this look from spring 2020. Another biomimicry look in involving another dog, this time what I believe is a Commodore dog, although this is not Animal Planet, so I could be wrong. The Commodore dogs are famed for their corded hair, which many associate with the human style of hair, which is dreadlocks. Roseberry seemingly created a simple suit using some sort of white cording to match the model's four-legged friend. A more casual look than appears, consisting of a high-waisted wide-legged pant, which Roseberry scribbles about how they're back to front denim with 24 karat gold top stitching, with a sort of gold bedazzled barely there bra top, which seems to create its own nipples to cover the model. And the two jewelry covered opera gloves tie it all together. 
A white fluffy explosion of fabric bears the décolletage of the model as it flows over the arms and down towards the calves, while a black skirt shows the sides and hips. In reality, if Beyoncé continues on her journey as Schiaparelli's most famous couture customer, I'd love to see her in this. An asymmetrical dress follows, which seems like it'll be embellished with jewels, a Roseberry signature. While the focus on the oversized sleeves continued on what I can only assume was a sheer fabric, as again the model's breasts were exposed. Roseberry then said, ego hair, don't care. And again, we see Roseberry play with this idea of exposure, but not in the lighting sense. A low draped skirt that covers only the private parts and legs from the belly button down is hung by a beaded necklace. It might just be a drawing, but I'm obsessed with this blue bedazzled crop top and simple low slung black pants. The long flowing sleeves filled with no doubt some sort of blue jewelry has matching gigantic drop earrings, which might be more of a commercial hit with Scaparelli customers. Either way, it's one of the best sketches from the collection in my opinion. If I could describe Daniel Roseberry's Scaparelli in one word, it would be cloudy. Not because I'm unsure of the concepts or references of the designs, but because Roseberry has consistently shown us pieces whose sense of gravity I still have yet to understand. Here, like in both Fall 2019 and Spring 2020 Haute Couture collections, is a puffed up sleeve, almost like a wispy cloud shape jumping off the model's shoulders. This look really feels like a tailored version of looks 5 and 29 from the Spring 2020 Haute Couture season specifically, and I would love to see how it's actually constructed in the future. Then came a tight-fitted dress with a sharp plunge, which has a face motif plastered all over it made out of what I assume is jewelry. Another one of those necklaces holds a draped skirt, while the finale looks wig creates a train. But again, it's Scaparelli. I want something I've never seen before. I want to be in awe. I want to be disgusted, shocked, confused. Were there interesting sketches throughout this collection, if you can call it a collection? Yeah. Do I feel like there could have been even more subversion, especially since fabric was not the required medium? Absolutely. Next up, let's talk about what you've all been asking me for, my review of Dior. Now, throughout the conversations being had in the midst of coronavirus, ones revolving around wearability, sustainability, and keeping fashion businesses alive seem to be the most prominent. The quote unquote queen of commercial, Maria Grazia Curie, didn't produce any clothing this season. Well, at least she didn't produce any clothing for humans. Her theme revolved around Greek mythology, which might be the reason she cast only white models, or it's just that she doesn't care how racist she actually looks. I forgot bellhops were also from ancient Greece and that they were required to be white. Now, while Maria Grazia is known for her feminism, it's usually white feminism that she utilizes, and very rarely is she actually intersectional. But karma is a B-I-C-T-H, and the collection is, well, you guessed it, messy. And considering the 14 minute attached to your video has Mr. Tumnus being a sugar daddy to the Little Mermaid while he lets her pick out Enchanted Forest Couture, and the fact that the entire collection is actually miniature and made for real life doll sized mannequins seems to prove that nothing that this woman can do is ever really correct. The first look is a simple white pleated gown with a rope harness, and it's actually quite nice up close. There is an ugly stepsister version in a muted blue that must be threaded with some sort of metal as it reflects the light, and the exposed decolletage with the harness in the middle might give couture customers cleavage rope burn though. The next look is a full skirted take on a bar suit in Christian Dior's famous 1947 new look silhouette. The fabric is interesting with juts of green rippling through the beige and smart sleeve slits that may expose the arm. The Godet skirt is particularly beautiful and a nice ode to the heritage of the house. A metallic pulled and pleated rose gold gown emerges with Maria Grazia's signature 
fugly belt. But it is swiftly forgotten as a pulled bar suit jacket in a crisp white creates a stunning display of texture and minimalism, while probably catching the eye of more conservative customers in hotter climates. Then she is serving me crumb catcher neckline from Say Yes to the Dress, and I am politely declining. Another suit skirt here in a jersey weave with both pleated jacket and skirt was actually delightful. I especially love the whimsical hem. The curls on the bottom of the skirt that flit up are often called lettuce hems or curly hems, and were actually invented by the designer Stephanie Burroughs. I'm happy that Maria Grazia is juxtaposing her quite commercial wares with these small but worthwhile details. Weirdly enough, this black opera coat, while not being terribly exciting, is crisp and clean and has a beautiful shape and the fabric is intriguing. If Maria Grazia's doer focused more on fabric development and creating elegant shapes that were actually wearable, she might get people to actually like her work. And then you see this next look with its vile reflective gold with messy triangles overlapping and you think, is this the same person designing these looks? Well, in Maria Grazia's case, I would assume just approving the looks, because unlike Danny Roseberry, I don't even want to imagine what her sketches look like. Also, I abhor all Dior belts under Maria Grazia, but the CD one is particularly hideous. It's ugly, tacky, and most of the Dior clients probably don't actually know Christian Dior's first name. And again, I am so lost. Focusing on fabrics and silhouette is smart. Adding more garbage art motifs to a white wool blanket coat is not. And from a distance, that CD belt looks like the new Valentino logo. The next caped gown is delirious. While it tries to create shape with a belt, the cage falls out at such an odd angle that it reads a bit Hunchback of Notre Dame if Quasimodo did drag. Poor Quasimodo deserves better though, considering LVMH is sponsoring the rebuild of Notre Dame after that fire, but I'm sure he's contractually obliged to wear some of their brands. This white jacket is beautiful! The black buttons and wrap sleeves are exactly the simple elegance I expect from Dior, and this reminds me of the work of former creative director Mark Bowen. Bowen worked at the brand for 29 years and was a bit of a fashion chameleon. And while I hope it's not true, the same could be said for Maria Grazia if the brand's clothing keeps making money hand over fist. Now, if the term dud muffin had a designated outfit, this look would be it. Something about the shape reads Elizabethan, although the lack of rough collar makes it unbearable to look at, and well, so does the shimmery black fabric. Now, Issey Miyake has pleats please. Maria Grazia has pleats no thank you. Now, next was probably one of the best dresses Maria Grazia has ever produced for Dior, which is the same considering it's not an actual dress. It's just this little trompe l'oeil sequin gown, but it's made for a mannequin, like, it's not even a real fucking dress. They didn't fit it on an actual person. It's, it's, it's for a doll who's living and is the same size every single goddamn day. Well, from afar, this gown looks like it's got wet toilet paper scraps sprinkled all over it, but up close you can actually see the metallic embroidery. Does it look better up close? Maybe to those with the most scary of the coronavirus symptoms the lack of taste. Now, I know I'm purporting myself as a fashion critic and I should probably explain why I dislike this dress, but you should at this point know why I hate it. But here's my thought process. You look like my foot! The next look, well, Kill it with fire. And now probably the most striking look of the collection, which surprisingly there have been quite a few, is this lilac gown covered in wispy feathers. Feathers are one of the foundations of haute couture and here a romanticism and dedication to craft is shown. But in reality, I don't know if this look could actually be recreated in the same manner on an actual human sized dress. I don't know if there are feathers in that size that exist, because, like, that would have to be a very big fucking ostrich. I don't think I've actually ever seen an ostrich feather that reaches from my mid-thigh down to my foot. And once again, a beautiful dress is followed by a dress that would be considered my own personal boggart. Remember that Harry Potter entity that came out of a chest and turned itself into your deepest, darkest nightmare? Well, this is what would emerge out of that wardrobe if I stepped in front of it. Now, to Marie Grazia's credit, I believe this dress, in my opinion, is a reference to Christian Dior's Fall Winter 1949 Junon 
dress, which was one of the most sought after from the collection because of its sequin petals. But here the swags of embroidery don't hit the same way. I have to say this muted greenish blue is a signature color of Maria Grazia, and here it works beautifully on this pleated dress with a stunning rope decolletage and sleeves. A white gown with French script embroidered on it is a reference to the Belgian poet Marcel Marianne's work. Marianne was a surrealist which ties in with the background of the photos as well as Curie's use of art throughout her collections. The phrase reads, Blanche et mourait, habille des pensées que tu prêtais. That, I don't even know if that was actually fucking French, which roughly translates to white and mute, dressed in the thoughts that you lend me. Marianne actually did a series of photographs where this phrase was painted on a nude woman's back and was Marianne's way of showing that women's bodies have been seen as blank canvases for male inscription. The point is not lost on me that as a white gay man, I critique the first female creative director of Christian Dior's work quite harshly, but often Maria Grazia's work tries to prove itself something that it's really not. It's not a brilliant combination of art and garment making. Rather, it's usually simple clothing that pulls from artist's work without really transforming it so that it has a new meaning. There are female designers that are constantly doing that recreation and transformation. Guo Pei, Iris Van Herpen, Mo Lola are some. Maria Grazia is not. The finale look is an opera coat of sorts that is a waterfall of black pleats. In reality, we're looking for something a bit more breathtaking, and in reality, the feather gown from earlier could have been easily switched with this look. Was this one of Maria Grazia's better outings when it comes to haute couture? Most definitely. But is that because she didn't have to make clothing for actual human beings that needed to be properly fit on human bodies? You betcha. Next up is Victor and Rolf. The design duo Victor and Rolf are known for their avant-garde approach to fashion, with meme gowns and walking picture frames being seen in previous seasons. Like another avant-garde designer, Iris Van Herpen, the duo debuted quite a small collection, but there were some pieces that were well worth it. There were also some pieces that really weren't. The collection opens with a simple blue spaghetti strap dress with lace and floral embroidery clouds sprinkled around, but seeing how Victor and Rolf sourced fabric from local textile makers in Amsterdam, I won't be too mad. Next, a gray and black gown reminded me of one of the main villains of Game of Thrones, Cersei Lannister. The mixture of floor-length silhouette with long and wide sleeves tied to the right side reminds me of Cersei's mixture of medieval fabrics with a kimono and wrap style. Here, Victor and Rolf modernized the silhouette with gray fur throughout with a luxurious looking black quilted lining and rope piping. And then that look is followed by the quintessential social distancing moment, a full length trench coat gown with slit sleeves that are far too oversized and fall to the calves, have matte leather and glittery spikes protruding throughout the coat dress. As I scroll on Twitter every day and constantly see videos of my fellow white people screaming, crying, and carrying on about not having to wear masks in the middle of a pandemic, I genuinely think that this outfit isn't as ridiculous as it seems. Then an emoji dress made out of lace, she can burn. No more emojis on clothes. Society has progressed past the need to put emojis on clothes. The next look feels like an upcycled blanket from a five minute fashion hack video, but like what I'd actually like to see happen to an upcycled blanket from a five minute fashion hack video. The pink fabric perfectly bounces off the gold quilted fabric and rope piping, while the layered bows on the sleeves are a really nice little touch. This next pink look feels like something you'd see at your local science museum when talking about aortas and microbes, but the sleeve that looks like it got stung by a whole hornet's nest and the steamship smokestacks are great for ventilation, I assume. The white knight dress with black and red hearts was meh. And while I love the red quilted heart pockets, the white quilting of the dress doesn't look very expensive. And well, it's haute couture. I don't care if you're using tin cans and used gum from underneath a school bus seat. Haute couture should always look expensive. Now, the finale look is another beautiful white floor length opera coat with silver glitter piping, but has another kind of piping as well. 
An ombre of red, pink, and white hearts descends down the shoulders onto the sleeves and to the hem of the coat in what must be Victor and Rolf's way of showing that love is still in the world. It's happening and it's working. Is it cheesy? Yes, but sometimes that is the best kind of love. So next up is one of my favorite designers in the entire world, the avant-garde Von Dutch oven, Iris Van Herpen, who specializes in 3D printing, laser cutting, and the use of science and nature as a way to model her designs. And she has given us not a couture collection, but well, a piece. Instead of creating an 18 to 22 look collection like normal, she and her team focused on one singular piece this season, which was modeled by Game of Thrones' Carice Van Houten. And well, when the Lord of Light says you should model for IVH, well, you don't say no because the night is dark and not full of haute couture. Now, this dress goes by the name of Transmotion, which is defined as the process of change from one state and form to another by Van Herpen. This diaphanous white dress kind of reminds me of Iris's name. Well, the flower for which she is named after. The way its pleats, which help to create a ruffle shape, flow off of Van Houten's body is splendid and creates a beautiful floral shape in a biomimicry that only Van Herpen has been able to achieve in the 21st century. Almost like veins, a black group of squiggles is meant to be the central roots of the garment. And while the white dress is definitely fantastic, it's true, the black veins, whether or not you like them, instantly draw the eye. The veins are allegedly made of duchess satin that was laser cut and hand stitched, but yet still have this 3D and sci-fi aspect to them. You might not be able to see them immediately, but little lines shoot from the center of the dress, each with a black tip meant to represent seeds and stamens, or the male fertilizing organ of a flower for those that need a science refresher. In reality, it's a floral masterpiece, but I can't help but say, fuck coronavirus, because, well, Iris's work, although not couture, is one of my top highlights of each haute couture season. And, well, when things get better, I hope that she remains one of the brands that are still standing. Next up is Guo Pei. Now, Guo Pei is China's premier couturier, and she showed one of the most impressive couture collections of the season. The collection totaled just 17 looks and was based on an exhibit about, quote, wild animals at the Museum of Natural History in Paris, where African animal statues migrated as if they were all together on the savannas of Africa. The collection opened with a leather suit full of wrinkles and creases that had a zebra head, mane, and neck attached to the jacket's shoulder and sleeve. Now, maybe Guo Pei is a hot Lamode stand, but you can't deny the eerie resemblance between this haute couture jacket and that crafty panda shirt we reacted to a while ago. So you can look like a zebra at every single event that you wear this shirt to. Like, maybe Guo Pei watches Crafty Panda too? Maybe Guo Pei is the Crafty Panda! This conspiracy theory is interesting, but even a couturier can't pull it off to make it wearable, and the strange folds on the jacket and pants don't help. Having to talk about this zebra shoulder leather shirt and tulle skirt is about 30 seconds of all of our lives that we will never ever get back. But the haute couture of Guo Pei is realized in this green flare pant suit. The coat is beautifully embroidered with giraffes and foliage, and their ears are actually 3D and made of sheep wool felt, which we will talk about later. It's just the craftsmanship that we expect from haute couture here, and knowing that someone spent countless hours hand embroidering this makes me both happy and extremely jealous of the person who's going to wear it. The front of the pants, made of that same leather and green, has an interesting backside story. See what I did there? It looks as if it's a green woven raffia, which is a plant that is native to tropical regions of Africa and Madagascar, which ties in with the theme of African animals. I do have to say, between utilizing raffia here and pineapple leather a few seasons ago, I enjoy that Guopay makes nods to her inspirations and brings in different textiles not usually associated with haute couture. Now, burning the environment to the ground is normally something I am very much so against, but well, if the savannas of Africa were the inspiration for this disastrous look, should they really be allowed to stick around? 
That was obviously a joke. Call it the mode does not condone burning down the environment under any circumstances. My favorite look of the collection is this beautiful gray suit. And now you're probably wondering why I think it's so great, because it looks very plain, but BAM! Have you ever had a leather elephant face manipulated and maneuvered onto the back of your suit jacket? Probably not. I actually am genuinely confused on how this was done. And again, it reiterates Will Pay and her atelier's commitment to the craft of clothing making and pushing the boundaries of how it can be done. The next look as a look is not good. While I love the idea of the ruffles, the high collar, and the juxtaposition of the black and the white, the jumpsuit aspect, as well as the giraffe motif crawling up the legs, isn't my favorite. But the sheeple felt we mentioned earlier is really highlighted here on these pants, or jumpsuit, as the face of the giraffe was actually hand molded using the felt. The ability for garment makers to actually be able to sit with a piece of fabric, felt, and a needle and poke and prod till a quite lifelike giraffe face appears is just the magic of haute couture. I don't know what's happening with this quilted zebra dress. I don't want to know, so let's just hope it dies and we'll move on. As for the shirt dress, it's very simple, but the giraffe knee-high boots and the giraffe butt on the back does make me laugh. And then again, the next look, I'm confused disgusted and scared. This stunning high-low leather top has the sheep wool felt giraffe butting its head over the model's bust. Matched with the white leather flare pants makes it pleasant. And when you see that from behind, the shirt splits down the middle and showcases two entangled giraffe necks, it adds a whole new dimension to the look that is not only sweet, but incredibly smart. Then comes this structured cocktail dress, which I can only assume are U-shaped godets and two leather strips falling below the dress make it very, very sweet. There is a small zebra butt on the front and a large zebra head on the back. And I understand that Guopay is trying to tie the clothing in with the theme, but like a red leather dress in the collection previously, I think this dress is strong enough with its silhouette and shapes that it doesn't need the animal embroidery here. A brilliant blue slash gray coat with a sharp upward facing lapel has turned the area usually associated with pockets into two elephant faces, utilizing that same leather manipulation technique, and I think it's brilliant. And the finale look from Guopay's Haute Couture collection is a stunning display of craftsmanship and excellence when it comes to embroidery. A strapless white leather bell dress is stunning enough, as it has such a crisp shape and could be an ode to the couture of the 1950s, but the sheer white half moon shaped collar with realistic giraffe heads draping themselves over the model's shoulder is just the cherry on top. Women's Wear Daily posted an article recently discussing how the Chinese fashion industry in recent years has been opening up more and more to the idea of black models as part of collections and campaigns. Not too many black models actually live in China from what the article says, and those that do might not be able to travel within the country or even be able to get back into the country due to quarantine restrictions. Now, I do think it's very important to note these discrepancies, as of the last few collections, Guopay's models have gotten increasingly wider, even though there was no restriction on travel at that point. So I hope her and her team are working to reverse this when quarantines are lifted. But all in all, it was a nice collection, and one of the most interesting we've seen from the fall 2020 haute couture season. Next up is Balmain. Now, as much as I would like to roast the ever-living shit out of Balmain, Olivia Roussong's collection wasn't really a collection, but more of a look back at the history of the brand, utilizing dresses and looks looks from Pierre Balmain himself, Oscar de la Renta, and Olivier. While I understand coronavirus has affected many ways in which designers design, I'm uninterested in seeing pieces that weren't designed by Roussong, as Balmain wasn't an especially interesting couturier to begin with. Sketch something. Do a Daniel Roseberry Scaparelli, you know what I mean? The only reason I bring the show up is that it was held on a cruise ship that went along the Seine River in Paris, and was probably one of the first times a plus-size model was depicted wearing haute couture in a fashion collection. The singer Yassol wore two different white couture looks, which I assume would have been custom-made considering their haute couture. Hopefully, customers might see that Balmain has no problem creating couture for not just size zero models. And, you know, maybe that'll bring in a bit more money for him. The other thing we must note is the infamous Balmain rip. The high fashion Twitter account Leo and Laurent pointed out that there was in fact a rip in a purple gown, and 
makes it hard to accept that Boundman's Couture is as strong as the other brands we have just discussed. I mean, it's Couture. There shouldn't be a goddamn rip anywhere. And then to have Vogue edit those images to save face, well, just made it worse. Olivier's most recent ready-to-wear collection was impeccable, and the prints of Demi Couture, aka high-end ready-to-wear, sold at semi-couture prices, should just keep working on his next ready-to-wear collection. Now, let's get into the finale, Chanel. Virginie Viard's first digital haute couture season has not exactly been well received. Well, at least not well received in the comments of the collection's YouTube video. And well, showcasing haute couture at lightning speed defeats the purpose, but in watching Loïc Prigent's videos documenting a bit of the process of how this haute couture collection was made in the middle of a pandemic made me feel all warm inside. And honestly, I can't say Chanel has made me feel warm inside in a long, long time. Seeing the hand stitches, the sequins, the feathers, how to keep hems smooth, and the processes behind how to sew tool was the craftsmanship that I expect from haute couture, and Loïc documented it perfectly, as usual. As for Virginie's collection, it's based on some aristocratic women Karl Lagerfeld considered muses and friends, but I feel that it's strange Virginie is looking to Karl as inspiration. Maybe it's to appease customers and industry people, but I just don't see this as true to Virginie. But at this point, maybe Virginie being true to Virginie is really not what we want to see. The collection started with a black tweed jacket with diamond-like buttons and a tiered skirt in black silk that helped elongate an A-line shape. The collection was meant to reference Cardle, and here we can see that it's in total opposition from Virginie's very good Catholic schoolgirl styles from spring 2020. Edad Akech wears a beautiful floor-length velvet ball gown, which was layered with Georgette, a lightweight crepe fabric, which is done because two pieces of velvet fabric will naturally shift against each other. So this dress was sewn using four layers of fabric, which is why haute couture is so spensy. I do love this dress. The way the white light bounces off of the black velvet is gorgeous, and I do wish we could see the strip of embroidered fabric at the waist, although I would have preferred my embroidery to be in black and white. That's also the magic of haute couture. You can customize whatever you want for the right price. This is probably the most rock cocoa look of the collection, which is what this collection is being described as in a smart and punny reference to the French Rococo era of opulence and far too muchness. The punk hair with a simple little black dress, a house signature, if you didn't know, is modernized by exposing side boob and rib cage. And we talked about this previously, but Virginie loves a tit. She just does. She loves when the girls just can see a tit. Listen, maybe she's a lesbian. I don't know. I mean, if she is, I'm living. I prefer that this next look is shot in black and white as it makes this floral embroidery tweed dress so much more striking. But unfortunately in this Chanel video, you can see the colorful flowers being, well, colorful. We can also see that Virginie Viard's famous white tights emerged as well. And I just have to genuinely ask, who wears white tights? Pennywise the Clown? Adut again stuns in a pink modern version of the three-piece suit. While many consider a traditional three-piece suit a jacket, vest, and pants, I think the more modern version consists of a jacket, short skirt, layered over pants. And with brands like Chanel and Peter Doe doing it, it makes a case for the new three-piece. And also I'm wearing a Peter Doe shirt if you wanted to know. A beautiful black tweed dress with a boxy silhouette instantly transports me to the world of Karl Lagerfeld's Chanel. And maybe in a way I was a bit presumptive to judge Virginie's use of Karl as an inspiration. She did work with the man for over 30 years and as the head of the atelier, she would understand how to create his signature styles better than anyone else. The gorgeous bijou or jewelry embroidered piping the hem, sleeves, pockets, collar, and placket helped just ooze the frivolity and wealth that is haute couture. Next was a two-tone lace style with a one-shoulder dress in black and white having sweet little flowers that were sewn on. One of the seamstresses within Chanel mentioned that often lace like this is inlaid, which means it's actually woven into the fabric. I'm trying to show you how they weave. Rather than sewn after the fabric was completed. But here these sweet little flowers were sewn on. And since it was sewn on the side of the flower, she assures that the threads are invisible. But the dress is stitched up with a pink lace one sleeve crop top layered underneath the black and white dress, which creates a more radical juxtaposition. I don't think it looks great, 
But Virginie did make another ode to her predecessor, Carl, as the Instagram account Inside the Mood noted a dress from Chanel's Spring Summer 1988 collection utilized a polka dot and white lace juxtaposition in the same manner. A silver and white lace asymmetrical dress concerns me. Between the one shoulder lace strap, the scary peplum, and what I can only describe as awful wave motif of silver and lace, it just screams, put me out of my misery. And I have a rule. If Ada a catch can't sell me on it, it's not worth being sold. A tweed dress in coral, pink, burgundy, and black has a wonderfully embroidered bodice. And as it reaches the hips, develops waves of feathers and embroideries, and even has a feather fringe at the bottom. I love the bodice. Can deal with the feather skirt, even though it definitely will make the wearer appear to have a fuller figure down there, but that's not a problem. But the multicolor feather fringe? Non, non, non. A red sleeveless tunic dress and flare pant underneath is striking, simplistic, and stunning. Virginie does create some commercial little masterpieces from time to time. A black and white image depicts a black bell cocktail dress with embroidered bodice and tulle sleeves. Attached are white tights and black silk heels with ribbon laces, maybe a reference back to Marie Antoinette herself, who was one of the most prevalent haute couture clients before haute couture as we know it existed. And also Carl loved the drama of 18th century France and found it riveting, so I could see the references. A black and white tweed dress has a striking bodice with white being predominant and reflecting light beautifully. The sleeves and drop waist skirt with a predominance of black are a perfect way to highlight the bodice. And while I hate the actual cut and style of the dress, I can't deny it's an interesting exploration of tweed color theory. Well, that would be a fun class at college, wouldn't it? Carl loved a husky silk like this navy blue gown and the transparent cape of chiffon adds that flu that couture ateliers are known for. Another simple black tweed look has that beautiful crystal piping along sleeves and hems and pockets, but it seems to be more geometric on this look compared to the previous one. And the fit of the jacket is also just perfect, which is expected of haute couture, but some brands can't even do that but we're not ready for that $100,000 conversation now, are we? Now, this is one of the most stunning looks of the collection. Is it wearable? Probably not, but well, that makes me love it even more. It's a white gown that has exaggerated hips that remind me of an 18th century pannier, which is an undercage that creates that exaggerated shape. The sleeves and shoulders match with that simple white, but part of the bodice and a sliver down the front is full of what looks like layered feathers that oddly remind me of one of the looks from Karl Lagerfeld's last haute couture show. It was pink, it was cute, it was in the jardin. You know, I enjoyed it. The most modern of the looks is this off the shoulder tweed dress. Is it incredibly impressive design wise? No, but I could easily see a brooding 13 year old heiress who doesn't want to go to another goddamn haute couture show skulking during her fitting about how the tweed is itchy. Virginie also wanted to include a lot of jewelry in this season's collection, but not the normal costume jewelry that is a Chanel staple. No, this is fine jewelry. This is like fine jewelry that has an attached bodyguard that follows it everywhere it goes kind of fine jewelry. And I assume that this little Eddie Slaman tiara is uh, worth a lot of money. A simple blue gown is paired with a floral embroidered bolero or harness. I'm not sure at what point a bolero is no longer a bolero and when it becomes a harness. The colors are quite stunning between the black and red of the petals and the green of the foliage. It is really gorgeous to see. Does the look hold up? Not in my opinion, but haute couture is really about the details, isn't it? Now, I don't think I've ever seen moiré silk in a Chanel collection before, and it's nice to see Virginie start to look at fabrics that are also becoming increasingly popular in the world of fashion. I mean, it was popular before, but with Marine Sayer and, you know, other people, you know, moiré is back in business. The high-low cut and sharp shoulders are reminiscent of Lagerfeld's work from the 1980s, and to me it's a nice little ode to Carl too. An absolutely stunning black dress has so many amazing elements of haute couture, with what must have been a painstakingly embroidered bodice and sleeves in black with purple beads shining like little gems in a dark cavern. The skirt takes on tiers of lace and silk, which add a grandeur to the look, almost like a princess from times gone by. 
Then a silver and copper tweed coat showcases the true nature of haute couture, as this jacket will have been hand weaved. Every aspect from the blues, the blacks, the silvers, the golds, the bronze, the coppers, and more have been hand shuttled from what I understand. And the braidings at the center of the jacket are probably hand braided as well. And like, listen, forget braiding my hair, I'd rather just braid tweed. The finale look is a light gray jacket and skirt with a large collar and large bejeweled cross. It's not terribly interesting and there isn't too much design detail that's noteworthy, but it's a light and airy way to finish the collection. Something else we must note is that it's traditional for couture shows to end their collections with a bridal look. But with a pandemic, there aren't too many weddings going on. At least not ones where a $200,000 wedding dress is necessary. So maybe for one of the first times in Chanel history, the art has done away with the tradition. And well, maybe that's all we can ask for from Virginie Viard Chanel. So that is the end of the video. I hope you guys enjoyed and thank you guys so much for watching. I really love doing these haute couture reviews. They're beautiful, they're stunning, they're fun, they're amazing. And it's really interesting for everybody to encounter haute couture in a way that is digital like we all do every single season so let me know what you guys thought in the comments down below i'd love to hear who were your favorite and least favorite collections of the season i will see you guys on the next one and ttyl